deliberate weaponization of hip hop. All right, so I definitely want to cover those topics, but I want to go back to the, to the marijuana thing because I heard you talking and you talked about, you know, that the loud and you said Molly, you know, at one point where government tested before they went out, you know, into the people and you cited that the higher THC levels is, you know, better for us as in raising the estrogen levels. Can you get into that and compare the THC and the CBD? aspect as well yes sir. so just let me clarify the language okay loud and molly are not just government tested loud and molly are government groups <clears throat> i'll be clear when we are talking about loud we're not talking about this cannabis god's holy herb no sir um and by molly we're not talking about the MDMA that Merck Pharmaceuticals discovered in around 1912. In fact, Loud and Molly have the same author, Alexander Suj, a Jewish organic chemist who produced so many of the street drugs today. He is the key figure in producing this loud version of marijuana. And it is his formula of MDMA. His specific formula is what we now know as modeling. Alexander Shujin, government scientist, he produced loud because he did two things, which distinguishes loud from cannabis. God produced cannabis for the benefit of man. Satan produced loud as part of what the U.S. Army Chemical Corps officer, Colonel James Ketchum, what he described as his conquer by cannabis operation. Mm. U.S. Army Chemical Corps, their work with marijuana and its chemicals was part of what they described as their conquer by cannabis operation. Loud was produced to conquer a population, us. What makes loud distinct is two things. It's loud because it has an, especially in comparison to um, the marijuana of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Loud has an excessively high level of THC and an excessively low level of CBD because CBD is a natural check on THC. When God created cannabis, he created it. The reason cannabis can be described as a holy herb, the reason cannabis does have medicinal value is because God formulated the proportion so perfectly. The portions of THC and CBD, for example, they synergize with each other in a way that CBD stays or stifles the negative effects of THC and enhances the positive effects of THC. But if you separate THC from the right proportion of CBD, that's like separating in the language of our lessons in the nation of Islam. That's like separating the brown germ from the black germ. And we are taught that it's that process of separating the brown germ in the brown gene, separating it from the black gene that produce the Caucasian white man, the double. The same applies here. Loud is a grafting out of CBD, 
and they grafting up of THC. And so it has a more potent psychoactive impact. The other thing Alexander Shulgin did on behalf of the U.S. Army Chemical Corps and James Kennedy. The other thing he did was insert a nitrogen atom inside the THC molecule. Why is that important? Oh. THC had always been unique among the psychoactive plants, plants that can cause a psychoactive reaction. Cannabis was always unique because THC was non-alkaloid. It didn't have a nitrogen atom. Heroin, for example, morphine or opium, a psychoact, a plant that produces a psychoactive chemical. It's an alkaloid because its psychoactive property has nitrogen atoms in it. Now, of course, heroin is very addictive. Cannabis originally wasn't addictive. A chief reason for the difference is the non-alkaloid nature of cannabis. The initially cannabis wasn't addictive because it did not have the chemical makeup necessary for addiction. It didn't have that nitrogen atom in it. It didn't have that alkaloid profile. Alexander Shulgin, on behalf of the U.S. government, fixed it. He inserted a nitrogen atom inside the THC molecule. Now, all <clears throat> marijuana products, all THC products that are made available, none of it is natural cannabis and natural THC. All of it is synthetic. The THC that's made available and all legal um, dispensary, all of it, the THC is a synthetic THC molecule, initially called Adam's nine carbon molecule. This is a synthetic, a fabricated, uh, lab created copy. Mm. Natural THC with the nitrogen atom in it. And this is why, and I'm closing this, this is why honey, loud is addictive. Mm. When you when, when, when you say you smoke every day, you got to smoke every day. I know the false narrative, while we have to smoke every day, we're busy saying weed ain't addictive. Well, weed wasn't addictive. But loud is profoundly addictive because it's a different chemical. And it was Alexander Shulgin who produced loud. It's Alexander Shulgin that produced the molly. This name dropped in so much of hip hop today. Awesome. I'm going to um, transition a little bit and talk about the um, the weaponization of hip hop music. You talk about that um, extensively, but two things in particular you talk about, you know, um, kind of like the beginning of hip hop where it was, you know, kind of uplifting message. And at one point it switched and you mentioned, you know, um, Snoop Dogg, Cypress Hill and uh, Seagram's Gin, you know, and then, you know, uh, at a point where, you know, um, there was a study on hip hop that drugs, alcohol, and violence references went up, you know, from 13 to 60%. Take us back to that um, and talk about the weaponization of hip hop in that first time when uh, Snoop Dogg mentioned Seagram's Gen and the agenda behind that. Okay, yes, sir. And and I think that's a great discussion. I think it should be framed okay. by another discussion. So I, I'm going to put something out there and then go after it in answering your question. Um, I believe that hip hop was weaponized in order to counter 
the influence of Islam on black America. Mm. And so in early hip hop, it wasn't just very conscious and very pro-social. It was very Islamic. And no one um, illustrates the nexus between you know, what they call rap nationalism in the golden era, rap nationalism and Islam on the one hand, and hip hop, right? The nexus is illustrated best by public enemy, right? Public enemy. Um, as impactful as they were in art on the his in the history of hip hop this is 80s this is pre nwa you go from run dmc and the braggadociousness right the typical the, the mc and, and then public enemy bursts on the scene with a radical political message but it's a political message anchored so strongly, not just lyrically, but visually, with the S1Ws, which were FOI. Mm -hmm. so the whole culture of Islam is being represented in this tremendously successful radical rap group. You no, know, who was surrounded on all sides by Jewish persons. So with the coming of public enemy and the rise of Islamic hip hop, the marriage of the, the whole landscape of hip hop in the early 90s, but really beginning in the late 80s with public enemy, that marriage of hip hop and Islam, Islam inspired by the Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan, because remember, let me say this, the origin of public enemies, Islamic message, is Professor Griff showing up in the studio with the album of the Honorable Brother Mr. Farrakhan's 1980 message, to jack the rap. Mm -hmm. When Griff showed up in the studio on that day and played for Chuck D, the ministers Jack the Rapper message in Atlanta. That began public enemy as we know it. And that was a turning point. That was a pivot point for the history of hip hop. So hip hop and Islam are are wedded together. Farrakhan has such a huge shadow over hip hop now. You have Paris, you have all of these um, articulations, different articulations of Islam and hip hop. And then what happens? There's a controversy, right? Jerry Heller and Brian Turner out in Los Angeles. They hear, they oversee the process from guys to niggas. You know, NWA, in the early NWA, was quite different from what NWA will morph into. NWA, as hard as its early lyrics were, NWA was born from the rubble of the crack holocaust in LA. That was ground zero for the crack holocaust in LA. The US government orchestrated crack holocaust in LA. So even the most social conscious hip hop coming out of late 80s LA was going to be very hard, very rugged, because it was born from the crack holocaust. 
but it was a very profound observation of what happened. Jerry Heller and Brian Turner, two Jews, when they put their money behind Easy E and Dr. Dre, and so Dr. Dre didn't smoke weed, right? He famously <laughs> said, rapped about not smoking weed, but what happened? 92 happens. The riots. The riots in LA happen. And Doug Morris, while LA is burning, Doug Morris, the Jew, Doug Morris, flies to LA, meets with um, Suge Knight. They are beginning to put death row record. He commits money. Him and Jimmy Iovine commits money for death row records. And the first production, while LA is still smoldering, Chronic is dropped. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden now, Dr. Dre is a big weed head. With just a couple years prior, he dismissed smoking weed. He didn't do it. And so now we have and we have the rise of this um, weed-soaked music. Cypress Hill, when Cypress Hill dropped their record, they were the first ones to really celebrate weed smoking. But that only affected the suburban whites. Okay. It was chronic that got black folks really smoking weed at that level because the study showed that by, before the chronic drop, young black people had the smoking of weed has receded tremendously among young people across the nation, especially black people. It had from the 60s and 70s by the late 80s and early 90s, it had bottomed out. But when the chronic dropped, and when, when you look at the chronic, you got to look past Dr. Dre and even Suge Knight. You got to look at Doug Morris, Jimmy Iovine, and Nigga Brothman, right? And with NWA, when they went from... Um, reporting the ravages of the crack epicenter to then they became a parody of self-hate, right? <clears throat> NWA became a parody of self-hate. They weren't authentic. Early they became authentic and Ren and Dre tells us how inauthentic that early NWA performance was with Jerry Heller and Ryan Turner directing them. And so we have the, the shift from gods to niggas. There was a lot of God talk, black God talk in early hip hop. And then it became when the shadow, Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam shadow over hip hop became evident. Then you see these Jews really going in full gear in terms of changing the trajectory of them. 